Our story this morning, the story story of the binding of Isaac, is a story about justice. It is a story that haunts us. It is a story about who our God is. It's a story about who we are as human beings. And it is a story of grace. None of these elements of the story may be apparent at first glance. When I was a young mom raising my two boys and in seminary to become a pastor, my boys somehow got a hold of this story. Maybe it was read in church like we did this morning. Maybe they heard it at Sunday school, although it's not really a Sunday school friendly story. I'm not sure where they heard it. But in the imagination of my young boys, it became plausible that I might hear a similar call as Abraham and be prepared to sacrifice them. They used to ask me with somewhat regular frequency, if God asked, would you sacrifice me? This is always one of the dilemmas of scripture, isn't it? If we read this story as our holy text, what are we to do if we were to hear God speaking to us as God does to Abraham? Well, my answer for us is the same answer I gave my sons. God will never ask this of us. Never. As we move through the narrative today, we will discover the specific context of this story, what God was doing here with Abraham and Isaac, and how we have inherited the grace of this story. And yes, there is grace in it, even if it's not immediately apparent. And the story will also illuminate why this will never be asked of us again. I want to add that any time harm is done in the name of God, we should be very skeptical of it. Often, harm is justified as being in alignment with God's word or God's call or God's command. In the end, Abraham is not actually called to harm his son at all. And so if you hear people saying, I did this harm in the name of God in order to be faithful, it should be an immediate red flag. This is not who our God is. And the gift of this story, I think, is it reveals that about God. And so I want to start by talking about what this story is not. Even though sometimes the interpretation of this story has been preached in a way that I think is not faithful to what's happening here. This is not a story of God asking Abraham to kill his son as a test of Abraham's loyalty to God. What kind of atrocity would it be if in order to prove to God that Abraham is indeed faithful, what he has to do is kill his child? It would be an unspeakable atrocity. And if this were what the story were telling us, we should get up and leave the sanctuary right now because this is not a God we would want to follow. I know the scripture says it is a test, And we will not ignore that. We will talk about what the test might be in this scripture. But let's deconstruct the horrifying interpretation that in order to prove loyalty to God, Abraham was going to kill his son. Let's just be done with that forever as an interpretation of this story. I think this is really where my son's bone-chilling fear came from. They were watching me say yes to God's call, to work at a church, to go to seminary, to become a pastor. And along the way, I kept talking to them about trusting God. And they began to wonder, what if my trust of God extended to the horrors of this story? My trust in God is steadfast, but not in the way my boys feared. If I heard God calling me to kill anyone or to harm anyone for any reason, my first step would be to seek psychiatric care, to seek spiritual guidance, and to limit my ability to act. This is, like Angelina said, one of the reasons why we worship in community together, because sometimes we mishear God, and we need a community of faith that can call us back. 
And here is the key, I think, to this story. The text suggests in multiple ways that Abraham did not really believe that God was calling him to actually kill Isaac. Yes, God was calling him to present Isaac on the mountain, but there are many places where the text gives us clues that Abraham trusted God, not in, I'm going to do what you said and kill my son, but trusted God in the way of, I believe you, God, will provide for me and this child, which is a different kind of trust. And I do believe this story is about trust, but it's about trusting our God to be good, a God of grace, a God who provides. Not to trust God when we hear God saying to do something that will cause harm to other people. And there is a clear difference. When we start at the beginning of this story, the story of Abraham and Isaac, not just what we read here this morning, Isaac is the child God promises to Sarah and Abraham in their old age. God tells Abraham from the beginning that God intends to make a great nation from Isaac who will be blessed to be a blessing to others. From the very beginning, the call around Abraham and Isaac that extends then through Jacob and the multiple generations is a call to bless others, right? And so we cannot forget that. God is not going to ask Abraham to act in a way that will go against that initial call and promise. When, God, when Isaac does not immediately appear to Abraham and Sarah, they begin to doubt the promise, and they act in fear. And Abraham conceives a child with their enslaved woman, Hagar, Ishmael, and we heard their story last week. And if you were here last week, you might remember that Sarah at some point became jealous of Ishmael once Isaac was born because she didn't want Ishmael to inherit the promise that God had made to her about her son, Isaac. And so she prepares to cast them out into the desert. Abraham, if you remember, had a qualm of conscience and isn't sure that this is the best thing to do. But God intervenes and tells Abraham, it's okay, go ahead and send Hagar and Ishmael into the wilderness because Isaac is the child who will inherit the blessing. And also, God says that God will take care of Hagar and Ishmael. The text really implies that this was God's means of setting Hagar and Ishmael free from the abusive household of Sarah and Abraham. And so prior to this call from God about Isaac, Abraham has already experienced a moment when he thought he might lose one of his sons. And God came in and said, my promise is still real. I will take care of your son Ishmael. In fact, I will make a great nation of him as well. Don't worry, Abraham. I will provide. And so God has reiterated the promise that God made to Abraham from the beginning. In through your son, really through your sons, I will make a great nation. And they will be a blessing to other people. Blessed to be a blessing. So Abraham comes into this situation with God's promise ringing in his ears. And with the recent witness of God providing for Hagar and Ishmael when they were cast into the wilderness... Abraham's trust of God comes from his experience of God as one who keeps promises and provides. Abraham isn't exhibiting a blind trust in God and marching his son to his death. Abraham is putting his son's welfare in the hands of the God who has already shown Abraham who they are. A God of justice who redeemed Hagar and Ishmael. A God of promises who gave Abraham and Sarah their promised child. So why then does God call Abraham to bring Isaac to Mount Moriah? There are multiple answers to this question, but one of the most important ones calls us to look at this story through the lens of the ancient Near East 4,000 years ago. So everyone who has some experience about the ancient Near East from 4,000 years ago, raise your hand and tell us what it was like. <laughs> no, we don't actually know what it was like to live back then. But of course, we have uh, archaeologists and historians who tell us something about the culture of the time. 
And at the time of Abraham, child sacrifice was a very common practice. Reading this story in 2023 is very different from hearing it in the context of the ancient Near East of Abraham's time. And what God is doing in this narrative is putting an end to child sacrifice for the followers of God through this story. Sacrifice to the gods was a common practice in the ancient Near East. People would sacrifice grain in order to secure a good harvest for the next season. They would sacrifice a goat to ensure the health of their flock. Sacrifices were not about offering the gods a sign of faith. They were about appeasing the gods so the gods would show favor on the humans and do things for the humans they needed for survival, like ensure a good crop. But this leaves people at the whim of capricious gods. What if you sacrifice a bushel of wheat and then the harvest is still bad? Next season, it might need to be two bushels of wheat from an already slim crop. If one goat is sacrificed and the herd still gets ill, what sacrifice is needed next? Perhaps the sacrifice of a child, your very most precious thing. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Jesus, the God we worship, comes to Abraham in this story and establishes a different kind of relationship with human beings. The God that we know is not like the capricious gods who might call for a bushel of wheat, a goat, or a child. God says to Abraham, trust me. And maybe it is not God, not trusting God and putting Isaac to death, but trusting God that our God doesn't have to put Abraham to death by a scant harvest or a flock of goats that becomes ill. God is not just saying to Abraham, put your son's life in my hands. God is really saying, put your well-being in my hands and trust that you don't have to sacrifice to me the way the other gods require sacrifice. God is calling Abraham to understand that trust in God means that God will provide not that we have to be the ones who are constantly scrambling to meet some kind of indefinite and capricious standard. Yahweh is the God who keeps promises and who is not capricious with the lives of human beings. The followers of Yahweh are not called to sacrifice their children. This is not what our God demands or asks of us. Instead, what our God says is, I will provide. This story of justice, of ending a horrific practice and telling the, Yahweh, the followers of Yahweh to be a different kind of witness in the world aligns with that initial promise that God gave to Abraham. You will be blessed to be a blessing to others. It is through your witness and the witness of your descendants for generations that people will know I do not ask this of them. I am a God who provides, not a God who takes. And this story, I think, tells us a truth about justice work. Sometimes when we are doing justice work, when we are advocating, when we are trying to unloose the bonds of injustice, it requires some sort of sacrifice from us. It can be work that cuts close to home and is really difficult. But there's a witness in this story about that too. Sometimes we think in order to unloose the binds of injustice that we have to almost die in order to do the work, give every last ounce of our life. But this story tells us that God is actually with us along the way and that God provides. And it is our job to join with God in the work of justice. Not to sacrifice ourselves, but to trust God enough in the work that as we meet God in those places, God will do the unloosing. And that our hands will get to be open to receive the justice that God has for us and for the world. When we read this story out of context, it is almost impossible to see this as a story of justice. 
But in the context of the ancient Near East, this is a radical story of a God that is just and cares for God's followers without demanding extreme sacrifices. This is the good news. God does not require us to sacrifice our children or ourselves, even when we are doing justice work, even when we are doing difficult things. God is there alongside us, providing what we need along the way. All of that being said, though, the justice, the provision, the grace in this story, it is still a haunting story. Perhaps that is because as much as we want to distance ourselves from this story with our modern sense of right and wrong and our righteous indignation, that we could never sacrifice a child, never do what Abraham does, even walk up to the mountain with our child. The story rings true that we have the ability, one generation to another, to sometimes sacrifice the well-being of those who come after us for our own comfort. Perhaps my boys were right to fear this story but not in the literal sense that I was going to walk them up the mountain. But instead, with the idea that we often live in a way that does not leave the world a better place for those who come after us. The way we might sacrifice our children looks very different from what happens in the story But history tells us that each generation has the capacity to sacrifice the future generation for our own well-being. Think of wars where we send our youngest adults out to fight. The up-and-coming generation is the one who goes to the front and loses their lives. Or climate change, which will not only impact many future generations to come, but will have the most catastrophic consequences for the vulnerable among us, children living in poverty around the world without the resources to withstand the consequences of the changing climate. Many of you know that recently I had the joy of attending my son Sam's graduation from college. He no longer asks me about this story. Maybe 22 years in, I've proven myself. I sat there and I listened to the commencement speeches at his graduation, and I noted something very different from the ones when I graduated. When I graduated from college, the commencement speeches sent us out to change the world. Go be your authentic selves, we were told. Go live with ethics, we were told. Go and change the world to make it a better place, we were told. It was such a hopeful and empowering charge to be sent out after college graduation with. I might cry when I say this. At my son's graduation, these college young adults getting ready to embark on their future were told that their job isn't to change the world, but to save the world. One after another of the commencement speakers named the atrocities and the tragedies that we are facing. Climate change, nuclear war, heads that could demolish all of humanity. The consequences of climate change where there will be things like more pandemics and droughts and famines. And those young adults were told that it's their job to save the world and clean up the mess that other generations have left for them. I didn't feel hopeful. I mean, I do feel hopeful because I know that generation, and I know my son and his friends, and I watch those young people sitting there, and I'm convinced that they can do the work that is ahead of them. And I'm deeply grateful for them. But I'm also so sorry that the charge they're sent out with is to save the world because what they're inheriting isn't better than what I inherited. And so, my friends, this story rings truer than I would like it to. 
And while my son's fears were not founded, I was never, ever going to march them up a mountain. Maybe they had some suspicion that this story might have more to do with their lives than any of us wanted. But here's the good news. Even as I send my son and my other son and my daughter and the graduates that we recognized up here just a few weeks ago out with enormous tasks towards reversing the damage that has been done to our climate, God provides. I think there's enormous work to be done, but I don't believe our future generation is going to be doing it alone. The same God who said, Abraham, over there in the bushes, there's a ram, is the same God that's going to walk alongside our future generations and help them find the means to do the justice work and to lose those bounds of injustice so that their kids and future generations inherit the grace and the justice of our God. And so when I am tempted to despair, I find hope in our up-and-coming generation because they are phenomenal. Just have a conversation with one of our young people. You will be blown away. They are amazing. And I know that the same God from 4,000 years ago who said we will not sacrifice our children is the God that is going to walk with this generation and say, we, again, will not sacrifice our children. And so we're going to do something to clean up the injustices, to unloose the bounds, and to set us all free. And so, as haunting as this story is, Maybe what it needs to haunt us with is what it means to trust God enough to sometimes give up our well-being for the well-being of future generations, to trust the leadership of the generations to come, even when we might be tempted to think we know more than they do. Maybe to trust that even though the work ahead of us and future generations is difficult justice work, that God will be there and will be providing along the way. And so may we find good news even in this difficult story and know that our God is a God of grace, a God of justice, and a God who provides. Amen.